Dampness in Buildings and Diagnosis, Module 3. Measurement of Moisture. Again, we're dealing with masonry and we're looking at gravimetric analysis. In other words, you've got to weigh it. It is known as the oven dry method and it identifies total hygroscopic air dry and free or capillary moisture. That is the full quantitative distribution of water in masonry. Its importance of such full distribution is emphasised in building research establishment digest 245, rising damp in walls, diagnosis and treatment, where it states experience has shown that some building materials possess a hygroscopic moisture content, air dry moisture content, of up to 5% even without the introduction of salts from external sources. This emphasises the importance of the difference between the air dry moisture content and the total moisture content measured on samples. So how do we do it? First of all, we need a balance, a three figure balance, a milligram balance. Samples collected by means of a so slow speed drill and put in an airtight container immediately. This prevents moisture loss before the analysis and allows them to be taken from site back to your office. We then weigh the samples. Ideally, as mentioned, they should be dust-like, but you can use small pieces, but it just takes longer. Number two, put the samples into constant air dry conditions. The problem normally is if you leave them in the open, the humidity in the open varies enormously, or it can do. So we want constant air dry conditions. And for convenience, these are set at 75% relative humidity. If you leave them there for two to four days to come to equilibrium. We can use higher or even lower relative humidities. This is done by changing the salt solution, which maintains the humidity in the chamber. We then weigh again. And the principle is very simple. If the sample loses weight, it dried out. In other words, the drying, it contained capillary or free moisture. And it was therefore subject to water ingress at the time of its removal. If the sample does not change in weight, sometimes it'll gain, it was dry, not subject to water ingress at the time of its removal. Finally, we dry the sample at 50 degrees and make a final weighing. And we now have all our figures and that is the complete procedure summary. Total moisture, hygroscopic or air dry moisture, one minus the other, total minus hygroscopic gives us the free or capillary moisture content. And of course the capillary moisture content in a material indicates the source of water ingress. If we take this to a practical level, we can sample for moisture and also make a salt profile. This is done by a vertical series of samples on which we do total free and hygroscopic moisture. If we look at a wall, for example this wall, we notice the bottom is damp and the top is not damp, or at least visibly damp. If it's rising damp, the groundwater salts will be present, as well as moisture if it's active, but above a certain height, there will be no groundwater salts and it'll be dry. And indeed, it's the presence and distribution of groundwater salts that are almost unique to rising damp. And indeed, the presence and distribution of the salts in relation to the presence of moisture are the major keys to the diagnosis of rising damp. And in essence, we really need to determine both. We can also use the method for other than rising damp, as we'll see. As mentioned just now, the method is particularly powerful for evaluating rising damp, but especially the performance of retrofit damp-proof courses. And if we're going to use a method, we need to know a little bit. We already know that the salts mark the maximum height to which water is risen, and if it rises further, so do the salts. But, just as a recap, if the wall dries down, the salts don't move, basically. They remain at the maximum height to which water once rose. So we can use this comparison between uh, the free moisture presence 
and the salt presence. The drawing on the left shows a non-effective DPC. There's free water present to the height of the salts. The center diagram shows salts up to a given height, but there is only water rising now to a much lower height. Therefore, that water has dried down from the original height as indicated by the salts. The third example is where we've got salts to a certain height, but we have free moisture rising above this. This indicates there's a further source of water ingress, i.e. free moisture above the height of the salts. Exactly how effective a damp proof course would be in that situation, we don't really know because we don't know how much of the water at lower level is still due to rising damp or how much of it was due to the water penetration. So let's have a look at several case studies. Here we have a moisture and a salt profile. Let's see what it tells us. There we go. We know that salts, or rather the rising damp, has risen to around 1200 millimetres in the past, as indicated by the maximum height to which the salts are present. However, we still have free moisture rising up to the same height. They're both at 1200 millimetres. In this case, we've still got fully active rising damp. There has been no control of the rising damp by the retrofit damp proof course. In other words, it didn't work. Another case study. There's, there's one of the several profiles that were drilled. And the complaint was that the damp proof course wasn't working. Therefore, the damp proofing company should come back and do it all again, etc, etc. In this case, however, the client did not want any replastering. No, he didn't want any of the replastering. He was told it should be replastering, and this was well covered in the documentation. So we have this result. We know that rising damp in both of those profiles once rose to somewhere about 500 millimeters. That's we've seen in the brickwork, but especially in the plaster. So we've got, we know that it once rose to 500 millimetres. However, there's no free moisture. Those materials are dry. There's no water ingress, nothing. In other words, the damp proof course has worked. The problem was, of course, the contaminated plaster because he could see some slight staining in that plaster, which he did not want removed. So here is one where the damp proof course has worked. Another interesting one was this 16th century hall. There about nine or ten of these profiles were undertaken and it showed that rising damp had once risen to 1250 millimetres. However, when you look at the complete profile, we've only got water now rising to 250 millimetres. It had dried down quite significantly and this happened in all the profiles. So, in this case, there was a proposal to put in a physical damp proof course of many thousands of pounds for this protection. However, the data did not suggest this. It showed basically there was no problem. It was an old salt problem caused by many, many years of rising damp, which was no longer active. No DPC required. Last one of these is an old external wall, 1830s terrace house, been damp proof course. Salts show that water had once risen to 1750 millimetres. However, when profiled, it was showed free water present to 1500 millimetres. It had only dropped a slight amount from 1750 to 1500. For practical purposes, this damp proof course was not effective. The odd one here, um, you can see this one, we've got free moisture well above the height to which rising damp once rose. Rising damp once rose to 1500 millimetres as indicated by the salts, but we've got free moisture to the full height of the wall, or as far as we could drill in that wall and get samples. But what have we got then? Well, we know that rising damp once rose to 1500 millimetres, but we've got free water well above that. 
what we're looking at now is we have another source of water ingress and when examined outside there was a small box fitted to the wall couldn't see any water run marks from it but clearly when it was raining water was collecting behind and penetrating the wall so in this case we don't exactly know how much water was coming from the rising damp and how much was coming from the water penetration because we don't know exactly how much water at the lower level was penetrating or running down the wall or into to the wall finally we go to this one it's another use of the um, uh, gravimetric method with sort analysis chimney breasts in the bedrooms first floor bedrooms and um, you can see the staining there was damp staining all around the chimney breasts and it was thought that there was water penetration coming around the chimney flashings poor pointing etc they had paid quite a lot of money so far to try and fix the problem but it was never fixed it, it we still got this staining so some random samples were taken and this is what we got front bedroom rear bedroom there are more samples than this but there we go we have salts present in both samples but we don't have any free moisture thus there is no water ingress the problem was the salt contamination around the chimney breast where did it come from long-term burning of fossil fuels and this salt had migrated from the masonry around the chimney breast into the finishes and these are hygroscopic salts but once they get into another hygroscopic material like wallpaper then it really does show up as dampness and visible dampness under conditions of high humidity note especially in the first one but or rather particularly in the first one there's a lot more chloride than nitrate this is typical of the long-term burning of fossil fuels what you may find around the uh, chimney note as i said earlier there is no water ingress they spent rather a lot of money on fixing things that didn't occur and this is visible dampness externally caused solely by hygroscopic or deliquescent salts derived from long-term burning of fossil fuels see where the two chimneys flues are shoved up very well The last meter we are going to look at is the carbide meter. We've looked at the gravimetric method and this effectively is a gravimetric method. You weigh things and this is how the carbide or speedy meter comes in a box. The meter scale to weigh the sample six grams can use a three gram sample and double the result and the reagent. The speedy reagent is calcium carbide and that's put in one part of the meter you see the meter in two parts with an o-ring and a six gram sample is weighed out a dust like sample it must be dust like and put in the other part of the meter the meter is closed and intermittently shaken to mix the materials and the principle is quite simple calcium carbide a speedy reagent reacts with water in the sample to produce a settling gas the more water the greater the volume of gas the system effectively is a sealed system so the more gas the greater the gas pressure and therefore there's a direct relationship between gas volume gas pressure and moisture content and there is a pressure gauge on the base of the unit which is calibrated for total moisture content by weight and that's the scale so then what are the problems with carbide meters one they're very slow to use they take about 10 minutes of sample by the time you've shaken up left it shaken up and left it to get the reading they're messy you've got to dispose of the carbide powder and the other little problem with them is they're used on site usually and they can cause the user to give an instant response which may not be helpful frequently the client is looking over the investigator's shoulder when this is going on the investigator is expecting something but it comes out let's say much higher and usually that's where the instant response has to come in if you're going to do such on-site testing
then ideally drill your sample out, put it in an airtight container and take it back to the office and do it. You've got nobody sitting over your shoulder looking. And on site, the other problem with them is they only measure the total moisture content. The results could be air dry alone. Capillary moisture, hygroscopic moisture cannot be undertaken on site with a carbide meter. You can only determine the total moisture content. And this can be a problem. Indeed, that's what happened in this case. This was profiled, believe it or not, with a carbide meter, the full profile. And you can see the total moisture contents. Very high, up to about 900 millimeters. So the view was the damp proof course had failed. The retrofit damp proof course had failed. However, when we did a full gramometric profile, when that was undertaken, it showed from the salt analyses that dampness had once risen, rising damp had once risen to about 900 millimetres. But the capillary moisture content, free moisture, water was only present at 100 millimetres, quite high. At 100 millimetres was the actual height of the damp proof course, so that would be expected. Above that height, the wall was technically dry. There was no water ingress. The high moisture contents obtained in the total moisture content were indeed hygroscopic moisture. This was due to the presence of the high levels of salts. So in this case, the damp proof course had worked pretty well. The problem was not any longer a rising damp problem. It was a salt problem, a salt damp problem. And the other error that you can make comparing different moisture contents uh, of different materials is quite simply, we've seen this before in one of the earlier modules, different materials have different permeability and porosity and there's our example of 7% in plaster, 4% in the brick and if one is attempting to make those sort of comparisons they can really lead to misleading results and inaccurate conclusions. However, all is not lost. If one reads BRE Digest 245 then that identifies the correct use of a carbide meter. And this simply requires you to take, or the investigator to take, double the sample. Put it in your airtight container, take it back to your office. When you're back there, put your normal 6 grams into the meter, shake it up, leave it. That will give you our total moisture content. The second part of the sample is put into our constant humidity chamber at 75%. The figures there should be lower than that. We'll use, say, one to three days, depending on how many samples in the chamber. So we've got our sample. It's gone into our 75% RH chamber for a period of time. We then weigh out six grams of sample into the meter, shake it up, leave it, and this will give us our air dry or hygroscopic moisture content. We then go back to our simple equation, total moisture content minus hygroscopic moisture content is the free moisture content. So we now know exactly how water is distributed in that particular sample. That is the end of module three.